Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mark Kennedy and Tim Penny to have invited me to the, to this meeting here, uh, to this uh, Minnesota Economic uh, Club. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Narayana Kocher Lakota, his very kind words, and more than anything, his invitation uh, to be here today. Uh, something that probably some of you haven't been able to put together is that uh, both he and myself studied at the same university, at the University of Chicago. And as I think it's uh, obvious to you, I'm a little bit older than he is, um, but, that, but our times at the University of Chicago uh, crossed, and uh, you always hear what other students of different generations are doing. And I have to say that you're very lucky to have him because he was very well known at, my, at, at the time I was at the University of Chicago that he uh, was one of the most brilliant students that had, had gone through the economics department of the University of Chicago, and I think his career obviously has made that uh, very, very obvious. So uh, uh, the Consul General said that Mexico was lucky to have me. I thank her for that kind opinion. I don't know if that's universally shared, uh, but certainly I can say to all of you that you're very lucky to have Narayana as the president of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, so let me jump right into um, uh, my presentation in, on the uh, perspectives of the Mexican economy, the outlook for the Mexican economy. And um, regretfully at this, uh, let me see if I get this right. Okay. As, as it is now almost uh, indispensable in any discussion uh, in, in, in the outlook of a particular country, uh, the external conditions are very important. And by this, I mean the global economic conditions, because I think we're going to a very difficult period of time. And uh, I don't think that no country in the world can, can claim that uh, they are decoupled from the rest of the world. And certainly, Mexico is and will continue to be a very open economy. Uh, we are very well integrated into the world economy, and in particular with the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is our main trading partner. 80% of our exports come here. Uh, uh, and also, you are the main provider of our imports. Uh, so uh, that makes that the external scenario, the external environment, really plays a very, very important role. Uh, so we are deeply uh, uh, aware of the situation that is going on in the US. Uh, but we also are concerned about issues like Europe and about other events that are, are taking place in the world economy, like what is going on with commodity prices and, uh, and what is going on with other emerging market economies. Uh, so let me start by briefly uh, going through some of these issues. Uh, and then go to the Mexican economy. Uh, of course, the, the I don't know if, uh, you know, let me do the presentation without slides. Because uh, I, I, I feel, really, I, since I cannot see, uh, 
but I know the presentation, and I think that you can imagine things. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think in the case in the case of the U.S., uh, having is well. Let, let, let me start in this way. Um, the U.S. went into financial crisis in 2008, uh, but I think that the U.S. has handled the crisis quite well. I think that you managed to take the economy uh, out of the I would say critical situation of the critical stage, uh, but then you still have work to do in terms of uh, facilitating the adjustment of the household household balance sheet, and certainly you also need to facilitate uh, uh, the recovery of the financial system. But all in all, I think that you are on the right track. Uh, what concerns us the most uh, is what commonly is known as the fiscal cliff. Uh, I think if that can be avoided, the U.S. will continue with a, 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 with a gradual increasing rate of growth, and that by itself uh, is good news for, for us and good news for the world. Uh, I think that the Fed has done an outstanding job in managing the situation, in facilitating the adjustment in the financial system, and in providing good conditions for growth. Of course, as uh, Chairman Bernanke and uh, uh, President Narayana have said, uh, all the work cannot be done by monetary policy, and that's why to have more certainty on the fiscal side is very, very important. Now for, so for us, uh, we're very hopeful that the policy that uh, uh, the Fed has been introducing will have an adequate effect in terms of uh, the, the economic recovery, and that uh, I'm, I, I'm also hopeful that uh, uh, legislators will act in a responsible way and avoid the fiscal cliff. And the, if that is the case, I think that the U.S. performance will not be such an important issue for Mexico. I think the other key element, the other key issue that is gravitating in the international markets is the situation of Europe. And regretfully there, things are far more difficult. First, I think it took some time for the European countries to realize uh, how difficult the economic situ situation is, was how deep the crisis was, and uh, uh, I think that they have started to respond more than anything, trying to align the different uh, policy components and uh, really establish a consistent macro framework in the medium to long term that more than anything would allow its exchange rate regime to hold. But I think that the two issues that are still uh, missing is for them to draw a path from today's situation to that medium and long term uh, picture that they, they, that they have defined already that certainly will, will, would give us a lot of confidence and would make Europe progress much more faster. And embodied in that is also the fact that there are still a lot of imbalances inside the Eurozone that need to be worked out. Uh, you, we still see countries with very high fiscal, with very high uh, current, current account deficits, some with very high current account surpluses, and they don't have a, the in the price mechanisms, namely the exchange rates, to sort of help uh, that rebalancing to take place. So that's something they need to work out and uh, so that they can do the fiscal adjustment, the deleveraging in a situation where they can, can also get growth going, because I think that is also an essential part. Uh, I think that, uh, why do I say that this is important? Well, because certainly Europe plays a very important role to have Europe 
with negative growth it is not helpful for any country in the world, but also uh, given that there is a possibility of a really bad tail event to take place in Europe, uh, like you know the exit of, of some countries or so on, that has introduced a lot of noise in international markets. And that has introduced a lot of volatility in international financial uh, conditions. And uh, so these factors have been playing a role in uh, affecting the, the situations that Mexico has been uh, facing. Uh, now, pass going, moving on to Mexico, I have to say that uh, we have fared this period of crisis relatively well. Uh, we just had a, a small blip in our activity in, in the first quarter of 2009, and uh, subsequently, uh, subsequently, GDP has GDP growth has uh, uh, started to grow uh, quite fast if, since since the, the the second quarter of 2009 to uh, uh, basically to uh, last quarter of this year. The Mexican economy has gone, grown in average 5.3 percent. This year will grow 4 percent, and I think that uh, under these circumstances, I think that's a very good record. Uh, what has been the key items that has given this result? Uh, I think the most important part is that after having suffered several decades of very poor macroeconomic management, uh, we have so, sort of established a, a strong track record and we have sort of institutionalized strong policy making and we have not suffered uh, many of the imbalances that affected the advanced economies. Uh, and let me just uh, mention a few, a few items. Uh, starting uh, from uh, the fiscal position, uh, we have a debt to GDP ratio of close to 30 uh, percent. Uh, since several years, we have been running a very conservative fiscal policy. Uh, we have a law, which is a fiscal responsibility law, that obliges us to present a budget, a balanced budget every year. We, ha or we have a, an escape valve that in, in hard times we can deviate, but no more than half percent of GDP. And at the same time, the government has to present a program how we are going to make that up so that total uh, debt to GDP ratio in the long term doesn't increase. Uh, uh, we went through all this process since 2008 without using expansionary fiscal policy. As a matter of fact, Mexico was the only country of the G20 that increased taxes in 2009, uh, just because we knew that lower growth will deb would debilitate our fiscal position. And I think that that has been a very good investment because in a situation where uh, markets have been doubting about the sustainability of the public finances, not to be in that situation has been to our advantage. Uh, something that also has been very powerful has been the fact that the central bank was made independent. Uh, that, ba that, that basically meant that the central bank cannot uh, finance the government at all. Uh, and, and therefore, we have been able to manage monetary policy only with the objective of keeping inflation down. And we have achieved that. Uh, we have brought down inflation from over 100 percent almost 20 years ago to around 4 percent today and to be able to su sustain it there. That has been able to, to, to increase always, obviously the welfare of the population and uh, uh, basically that also has allowed our banking system to flourish. Uh, right now, Mexico has a very strong banking system. It's a very well-capitalized banking system. 
it, it has a capital to asset ratio in average of around 16%. We will be Basel III compliant uh, in January of this year fully. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we ha we're complying with the newest and more and stricter, uh, stricter uh, standards for regulation and supervision six years in advance of the final point where uh, the rest of the banks, uh, in, in, well, in many parts of the world, will do. Uh, this has improved substantially the sustainability of our debt. Uh, I think that, uh, let me give you just one figure. Uh, in, in 1995, the Mexican government could not finance itself at a rate lower than 100% for a period no longer than seven days. And now we can finance ourselves at 6% for 30 years. And the average maturity of our debt uh, before it, uh, in the, in the mid-90s was 200 days. So that means that every 200 days we had to roll over our whole debt. Now it's eight years which as a matter of fact is higher than the average maturity of the U.S. debt. Uh, so I think that this is a very important change in the environment. Uh, I think all in all this has reflected itself in much better conditions for economic growth. Uh, as I said, this year we hope to grow at the rate of 4%, and I think that is a, a relatively good rate of growth given the way the world economic situation uh, is. Now, this, this doesn't mean uh, that Mexico is not a, a risk-free, that uh, we have done everything that we could do, that we don't have any challenges. Uh, I think that the main lesson that we have learned from this crisis is, is that it pays to have a very strong macro framework and that as a country it pays off to invest in establishing strong, strong pillars in that framework. And that framework has to encompass fiscal policy, has to encompass monetary policy, and also a very, very strong financial sector. Uh, uh, so we are there, but that gives you just a certain amount of potential growth. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Mexico should increase its rate of potential growth. Mexico is a country that could have a, rate, a potential rate of growth close to 6%. Uh, we have done studies in the bank that show that that is the case. So our main challenge is how can we enhance growth? And I think that the key for that is to stress a lot what generally is called structural reforms. And structural reforms basically mean how can you make much better regulation in particular markets and activities so that you promote investment, uh, you promote further employment there, but more than anything, you lower costs and make the economy more competitive. Uh, Mexico still has uh, important distortions in the labor market. Right now, we're in the process of legislating a labor reform, uh, but we also have very important opportunities in the energy sector. Uh, Mexico. Uh, for historical reasons, uh, basically the public sector holds the monopoly both in electricity and oil. And uh, it's a sector that uh, if we open it gradually, certainly that would, would invite very strong FDI and also would lower costs. Not only firms would, would uh, I would say improve their costs by having a, a, to having to pay less, I would say, for those for energy, 
but also the quality of energy would be much better. Uh, we would have a much better distribution of energy in the country, and that would allow to have a more even development regionally in the country. Uh, we also need to have a, a much better antitrust legislation, uh, and that also would open up the investment in different sectors. Uh, just to give you a piece of information uh, related to the CPI, uh, close to 40% of all the goods and services that are incorporated into the basket of the Mexico's CPI are not subject to competitive forces. Uh, so that, of course, makes it very difficult, the convergence of our inflation rate to our objective of, four, of 3%. Uh, but the benefit would, if we would have more competitive forces in those sectors, uh, that would not also make the life of the central bank much easier, which that probably wouldn't be the, the best incentive to apply antitrust legislation. But the welfare of the population would increase uh, dramatically. And so the welfare gains in terms of applying that, that stronger laws in that respect would be very, 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 very useful. Uh, I think that these, these uh, gains are comparable to the welfare gains that Mexico obtained, for, uh, for example, with NAFTA. I'm, 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 I, in the U.S., I, I think that uh, there, is, there is no a very strong consensus of, of the benefits of NAFTA, and certainly it's not so much in the minds of the population. But, but for Mexico, especially from an economic point of view, it really was a watershed uh, event. It basically forced Mexican companies to be able to compete uh, I think that it has allowed Mexico to compete effectively against China. Uh, when China incorporated itself into the world economy uh, into the first decade of this century, uh, Mexican firms was, were caught by surprise. Uh, we uh, lost market share against China. But for the last three or four years, we have now gained market share ba back in, in U.S. imports against China. Uh, we lost, we went from having like 12% of your imports to having like 9% of your imports. And now we're back uh, at over 12%, uh, making Mexico the third trading partner of the U.S. after precisely China and uh, Canada. Uh, so I think that the same type of impulse can, uh, can Mexico receive uh, from uh, their regulating and opening for competition more some sectors uh, in, in, in our economy. So uh, I, would, I would like to say that uh, Mexico uh, is a very strong economy. Uh, we have sort of tested it by being able to navigate safely through, through these very turbulent waters, uh, to have engaged in, uh, very quickly again, to, to be able to, to grow uh, at a very decent rate during these very turbulent times. Uh, we prevented the contamination in our financial system. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have, we're one of the few economies that has a banking system that is ready and fully capable of promoting economic growth. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, good times uh, are ahead of us. We shouldn't let our guard down. We should continuously invest in keeping the strong macroeconomic fundamentals, 
both fiscally, monetarily, and in the financial sector. And we should uh, to move to jump from rates of growth of around 4% to around 6% to move in this uh, politically complicated but doable, uh, doable uh, 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 structural reforms. And finally, we hope also for the benefit of all of us in this room that the world economy, especially in the advanced economies, improve soon. That would be sort of the cherry in the pie because then we also would get much more support from the world economy in terms of grow growth. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for those wonderful remarks, a good overview of not just Mexico, but of the world economy. So we're going to just take a one or two questions here. Well, you think that we have, uh, well, we're getting a mic over there. I'll ask the first one. Uh, 30 years ago when you were at Chicago, they, they created this Washington consensus idea between the IMF, the Treasury, of balancing your budgets, low government intervention in the economy, uh, open markets. Uh, you've certainly embraced that at Mexico to the benefit. We talked a little bit yesterday about some of the difference between Brazil and Mexico in terms of their approach towards uh, some of the things like currency markets. It'd be interesting for our, our audience to hear about that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's difficult for me to comment <laughs> I, I, about uh, Brazil. Um, uh, well, I, I will do it, I think. <laughs> I think Mexico has done much better than Brazil recently. And I start by saying something that for Mexico is extremely meaningful. In Mexico, the main sport is soccer. And we won the Olympic gold medal in soccer. <laughs> and we beat. And, we, and it was especially good because we got it beating Brazil. <laughs> so I think that is one comment I can make about Brazil. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I certainly think that Me Mexico is a far more open economy than Brazil. And let me concentrate basically on two items. I mean, I think Brazil, after its crisis, has also improved substantially its macro policy framework. Uh, they have established very solid, also very solid foundations, but I would say that they are more interventionist countries than we are. Uh, uh, one particular area in which uh, Brazil, and I would say all Latin America other than Mexico and a few other countries like Colombia and Peru is that they are very protectionist. They don't believe in trade. Uh, as a matter of fact, recently Mexico has been affected by protectionist measures taken by Brazil and Argentina. But let me give you just one piece of information uh, to support this view. And that is the fact that Mexico exports to the US more than all Latin America, the rest of Latin America put together. Uh, so that tells you a little bit uh, uh, the different point of view in terms of development. Uh, in another area where, where I think Brazil and Mexico dif differentiate each other is that uh, we allow markets to work in and, and this is important in one market, especially, which is the foreign exchange market. We have a freely floating exchange rate. Uh, uh, even though we have been subject to many of the same forces as Brazil, Brazil has been very interventionist in the foreign exchange market. And they have used many different uh, policy measures that I think more than anything uh, blurs 
the message of the authorities to the markets. I think that the reliance on capital controls, on taxing, taxing uh, capital inflows, uh, using a lot what has now been called macroprudential regulations, uh, uh, sometimes they work, but they don't seem to be that effective. And I think more than anything, uh, you don't allow, uh, I would say, the price signal that the exchange rate sends you to work through and to allow the adjustment in the real sector. If, for example, you are trying to prevent the appreciation of your currency and in that way protecting your domestic industry, if you keep that going forever, then the, the industry will never it will never become more competitive. And in a way, that is what has happened in Brazil. And I think that the fact that, that you let the price market provide the right signals uh, uh, has al allowed and benefit Mexico in terms of uh, adjusting to uh, the, the, the world and become more competitive in, on a sustainable basis. So not just better than not just better in soccer, but better in soccer. <laughs> we'll take one question and then go ahead. Well, I mean, I certainly uh, what it has been happening here in the U.S. is a, is the operation of monetary policy under very unusual circumstances and under circumstances that there are very important risks going on, and therefore. Uh, the, the policy decisions that have been taken that under normal conditions would uh, uh, awake certain fears, uh, I would say have a different impact under very unusual circumstances as the one you are having here. Uh, basically, the liquidity that you say that is being created, as a matter of fact, is not having such an important impact on the economy because a lot of that is just remaining in the balance sheet uh, of the Federal Reserve Bank. I mean, banks are holding more reserves and therefore the amount of liquidity that is circulating out there is not much higher. No? So in that sense, in the sense of increasing high power money and increasing, I would say, a, a liquidity in such a way that a, that would generate inflation, I think that is not taking place. I think what the Fed has been trying to do is a, a designing appropriately its monetary policy more than anything to affect the yield curve, and that is by trying to absorb certain type of securities, by long-term securities, selling short-term securities, and in that way, we're providing stronger conditions, stronger conditions for growth. Uh, I think all in all, uh, uh, the policy has been well designed, uh, uh, I think it has helped uh, to regain the stability in the financial markets. Uh, I, I think it is certainly helping 
the recovery of the U.S. economy. Uh, and uh, I would say that yes, in a few years when conditions are different, the Fed will have to be very careful in the way it exits its strategy. Uh, but, but as it has been said in more than once uh, by Chairman Bernanke and other board members, they have the right instruments. So, so far, the fact that we, we don't see higher inflation in the U.S. is not a matter of luck. It's just the fact that policies have been well designed and well implemented. Good. I, I think given the uh, time frame, we're going to uh, cut it off at that. But let's give another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.